everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Noortuis. I'm one of the primary maintainers of Node.js, LibUV, and uh, HTTP parser. That's the, the parser library in Node.js. Um, this talk is not going to be about JavaScript. We're going to dive into the deep end. It's going to be C all the way from here. I'll be talking about LibUV, and more, more specifically, I'll be showing you how to write a chat app, the hello world of the Node.js world, uh, how to do it in LibUV. Um, I would recommend that you check out the source and follow along. That is, if you have a re reliable internet connection. So, LibUV. LibUV is a relatively small C library that intends to provide a unified interface to the various platform-specific file and network APIs, in particular the asynchronous APIs. Um, as such, it's written in C for maximum portability, also to make it easy to write bindings to other languages like JavaScript. Um, for the things it does, it's fairly small, about 40,000 lines of code, and truly, uh, as a matter of fact, almost half of those 40,000 lines are tests, so the actual library is just over 20,000 lines of code. It supports all the major APIs, EPOL on Linux, KQ on the BSDs and OS X, event ports on Solaris, uh, and ISOP on Windows, and if you have an AIX machine or HP UX, it will use select or uh, pull. A couple of projects that use Node.js, uh, Node.js, LibUV. <laughs> Node.js itself, obviously, Node is really just a, a wrapper, a glue uh, between V8, LibUV, and some JavaScript. Another project is Loveit, which is a kind of Node.js for, for the Lua language. Um, one of the major benefits of using Loveit is that it has a smaller footprint, memory footprint, than Node.js. Yet another project is Rust. The Rust language, developed by Mozilla, it aims to be a a kind of functional programming language that is also a system programming language. And the Rust guys are doing some quite innovative stuff. If you're into programming language design, I would urge you to check out Rust. Yeah. Yet another language that uses LibUV in its core library is Julia. Julia operates in the technical computing space. Uh, it's it's in some respects, a competitor to, to R, the statistical computing language. Um, the main aim of Julia is to provide a high-level language that still has high performance. If your company does a lot of number crunching, Julia might be a good fit for you. OK, so on to the actual chat app. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to, to build and run. Clone repository, run make, and start the program. Okay, quick look at the directory structure. There's a top level make file. The bulk of our program is a main.c, and libuv is in depth slash uv. About that make file, here it is. Now, if you're saying to yourself, hey, that's a lot of code that I have to type out in order to build such a simple project, and it is a simple project, the main.c file is maybe 160 lines, but if you think that's a pretty big make file, you might want to use jip. JIP is a build system uh, developed by Google and used by Google. 
and also by Node.js. It's a kind of uh, a meta build system. It generates project files for other build systems. This is an example. This is all you need to build our chat app. So a JIP file has a kind of a JSON-like structure. You tell, tell JIP to, to generate actual project files. In this case, we tell it to generate a make file. But it also supports Xcode, Microsoft Visual Studio, Eclipse, Cons, Ninja, which is a kind of lightweight build system designed to speed up builds. And of course, make. Now, the actual program, this is the main routine, the, the entry into our program. So I have removed the non-essential parts. What happens here is that we create a TCP server handle, we bind it to a public interface. Next, we tell a libuv to make it a listen, so a listen socket, a listen handle. And that whenever a connection comes in, it should call our on connection callback. And last but not least, we start the actual event loop with UV run. Once you call UV run, your program does not return until you've closed all active handles. So for most programs, UV run is the, the final destination. From there on, it's all event driven. Now, the on connection callback. So, when our on connection callback gets called, it means there is a new connection pending, a connection from a user. So, we allocate a little bit of memory to, to maintain state in. We create a handle for the client, accept the new connection. Then we tell libuv to start listening for incoming data. And finally, we broadcast to all users that, hey, there's a new user. So this is the on-read callback. Now, the on-read callback does two things. One, it's supposed to handle network errors. If that happens, we close the connection and broadcast a message saying that the user has gone. If all goes well, however, we have received some data from the user. And what we do is that we simply broadcast it to all other users, which is, of course, the basis of a chat app. Now, this is the broadcast function itself. It's not terribly interesting. The main takeaway is that it formats the message and sends it to all individual users that are currently connected. Now, this is the function that sends the actual message to a user. For those of you who have checked out the source, you will notice that the actual implementation is a bit different. Um, for one, we're doing two allocations here, and the version that is on GitHub does just one as a matter of efficiency. But for the sake of clarity, this version does of first allocates memory for a write request. Then it makes a copy of the message. And you may wonder, why do we need to duplicate it? It's because, if you go back one slide, you'll notice that broadcast puts the message in a buffer that's allocated on the stack. Once broadcast returns, that memory is no longer valid. If we did not make a copy, what user would receive would be either garbage or the program would simply crash. Therefore, we make a copy. Now, then we tell libuv to send 
the message, that's the UV write function. When you call UV write, libuv will try to send the mes message immediately. However, that may of course not always be possible if, for example, the network buffer is full. So what happens then is that libuv queues up the message for later delivery as soon as uh, the network buffer is empty again, as soon as we can send out data again. This does mean, however, that you should not keep calling UV write indefinitely. As a user of libuv, you have some responsibility to check if the queue is filling up. If you don't, and the network is really slow, you will slowly but definitely start using up memory. In the worst case, you'll be using up all available, available memory. And by that time, the operating system will kill your process. Now, this is the final function that we'll be, be dealing with. On right, this is called once libuv has sent out our message. In this particular implementation, it doesn't do anything really spectacular. It just frees the data that we allocated on the previous slide. Um, in a somewhat more robust implementation, you would check the status code to see if any errors had happened while sending data. But in this case, it doesn't really matter because if sending the message fails, uh, it's too bad. We still need to free the memory, um, so that's all it does. Okay. This is usually where I would do some live action demoing, I, where I start up uh, the actual chat server and have people connect and people can write messages and they will roll on the screen and everyone will have a great time. Unfortunately, the Wi-Fi here is kind of unreliable and restricted. I couldn't get it to work. So that is too bad. Um, which leaves me nothing but to conclude this talk. I hope you have a fairly decent impression of what LibUV can do for you. This is just a very simple example, of course. All we do is start a server and proxy some messages uh, back and forth. We haven't even treated how to create a client connection or the other things LibUV does, like spawn child processes, set up inter-process communication, uh, timers. I was going to do that. Uh, I was planning to, to add that, but since this talk is only 20 minutes long, it might not have fit. How are you for time anyway? Sorry? Nine minutes. Okay, well, then now might be a good time to take questions, I think. Are there any questions? None at all? <laughs> okay. The question is, can you give us some background on why LibUV exists in the first place? LibUV? was created last year because we were working on porting Node to Windows. Now, before we started work on that, Node used libev, which is uh, also an event-driven library, which works quite well, but has a distinct benefit that it has a very Unixy model that is on most Unixes, you have system calls like, um, well, ePoll and KQ. 
you call them and you don't return until something of interest happens. Now, asynchronous I.O. on Windows uses a quite different model. IOCP, that is the name of the Windows API, uses a, I suppose I could call it a don't call us, we call you model. You tell Windows, hey, I have this handle, be it a network handle or a file handle. And when something of interest happens, give me a ring. And what it does, it calls a function. So Windows is really uh, event driven, or is already event driven. OK, so libev does not at all support this model of communication. And that's why we started work on libuv. Uh, a fun thing about libuv is that it's uh, largely sponsored by, or at least initial development was sponsored by Microsoft. Actually, my first four months as a uh, paid developer on Node and libuv were paid by Microsoft, which was really great because in the end, it was the other guy, Bert Belder, who did all the work, but I still got paid. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Any more questions? I'm seeing no hands. None at all. Oh, you over there. Sorry, can you speak up? What I would like to see go into the project. Ah, where do we go from here? Good question. Um, one thing we're actively working on is the scalability of the thread pool. So you may know that Node.js, while being single-threaded itself, or at least the JavaScript side of Node being single-threaded. Node does use threads for, for example, for some file operations, because not all file operations can be done in an asynchronous manner. So you need to offload those to a thread pool. OK, so we have this thread pool implementation, and it works, but it's not great. It's not really fast. In truth, in most applications, it's a bottleneck. That is, if you have an application that does a lot of file I.O., obviously. If all you do is network I.O., there's nothing to worry about. But file I.O. is something of a, a weak spot in Node and in libuv. So we're trying to address that. Um, now, some of the things we'll be doing is, well, first let me tell how it works right now. If you open a file, try uh, read some data from it, then close it, what happens is that three operations get posted to the thread pool. Well, that's not so bad, but what is bad is it happens like this. First, the open request is posted to the thread pool. That request gets processed sometime in the future. Then it comes back to, to the main, to the event loop, to the main thread. Next up, node queues the second request, which is to read a, a, a few bytes of data. Goes in the thread pool, comes back. Same for the close request. Um, all this switching back and forth between threads is not really efficient. It's actually pretty inefficient in that File I.O. is right now about 10 times slower than it could be. So what we are planning to do is to make it possible to combine all those requests into a single one that you post, and that comes back all done. 
And that sounds trivial and straightforward, but of course the real world is slightly more complicated. Mm. There is a nice optimization we can possibly do on Linux. Linux has this splice system call, which is um, if you imagine a Unix pipe, a Unix pipe, you write data into one end and it pops out at the other end. That's kind of how splice works. And the fun thing is you can splice from, for example, a file to a network socket or vice versa. Now, one drawback of splice is that, oh, two minutes I see, okay, I'll try to hurry up. One drawback of splice is that it can be blocking because file.io can be blocking on Linux. And one major issue on Linux is that it's sometimes possible to do asynchronous I.O. on a file and sometimes not. But the kernel won't tell you if it's possible. If it's not, it will still do what you ask it to, but do it in a synchronous fashion without giving any indication. So if you're not careful, you'll find that your application all of a sudden becomes synchronous and is a hundred times slower than it should be. Okay, back to splice. So some file, operation, file operations can be synchronous. You cannot determine if that will actually be the case. So what we are going to do is offload this splice operation to the thread pool, but since splice is a kind of pipe, that splice can just pipe the data straight into the main thread and out into whatever you want to send it to, a socket or another file, it doesn't matter, which should give us, uh, should give us a nice performance boost. I did some preliminary benchmarks and I was able to push about 80 megabytes of data instead of the usual 20, so a fourfold increase. That's kind of nice, I think. And now I should conclude the talk, I think, because we're out of time. Right? Thanks.